These blobs make biology as we know it possible. They are life's molecular machines. You've seen them in biological animations everywhere, but what are they and how do they work? Today, we will be taking our metaphorical car apart and giving you a tour of how each of the cogs and wheels work together to support life as we know it. All of this will culminate in using these principles to reverse engineer how an anti-HIV drug works. Let's get started. When I say molecular machines, I mean enzymes. Enzymes make reactions happen faster and easier. They catalyze the reaction. And by faster, I don't just mean 20 to 40%. No, no, no. These enzymes we're looking at today goes up to 10 billion times faster. It does this by using its structure to optimally position the chemicals and by using its little robot arms to pick apart and reassemble them. This not only increases the speed, but the enzymes also force specific reactions to happen over others. It means that from the soup of chemical reactions that can happen, you can coordinate it into a system that actually functions. It's an act of rebellion against the ever-consuming force of entropy. There are many enzymes out there with many functions, so I'll be focusing on chymotrypsin an enzyme that is the gold standard for getting biochemistry students started in the wonderful world of molecular machines. But don't worry, I'll assume very little to no background, so even the burger flipper from McDonald's can tag along once again. Speaking of fast food, chymotrypsin actually plays a role in all of this. It's in your intestines, and it breaks down the proteins you eat into smaller bits which get further broken down by its cousins into amino acids, so they can be absorbed into your blood. These enzymes are known as proteases. The prote stands for protein, and ace is the suffix for enzyme names. Imagine if this process was a billion times slower. But you know what's meta about all of this? Most enzymes are proteins, and that includes chymotrypsin, it's a protein that shreds other proteins. Chymotrypsin will give you the key intuitions you need to understand molecular machines. In particular, you'll understand how it can force specific reactions to happen, how this wonky noodle shape came to be, and why it is essential for the enzyme's ability to function. And you'll learn about the clever strategies it employs to boost reaction speeds by a billionfold. Understanding these ideas will also lead us to understand how the HIV virus's own protease works. But, well, what are proteins actually? All proteins are made from linking amino acids together. There are 20 canonical flavors out there, just like there are four bases of DNA. Each flavor has special properties, which interact with one another to give the protein its structure. Then that structure gives rise to its function. Keep this in mind, this is a very important idea in the field of proteins. Let's start from the beginning and explain how a simple string of DNA letters can encode such a complicated structure. Three letters of DNA encode one amino acid. The individual basis of DNA then gets transcribed into RNA. Then it gets translated into proteins. Once the proteins are made, they fold into structures depending on the sequence. But how do they do this? How do they know what the right structure is? How do they retain their shape without any physical tethers? The key idea behind protein structure is forces, both internal and external. And different amino acids have different and unique forces associated with them. These interactions between these amino acids in the string pulls, folds, and holds the structure together. A typical motif you always see in proteins are these sheets and these helices. These are held together by dipoles, in particular, hydrogen bonding. Oxygen and nitrogen like electrons more than carbon or hydrogen, so it forms a charge magnet, a dipole and these magnets interact with one another to coil the string into alpha helices or flatten it into beta sheets. Hydrogen bonding is one of the four major interactions that shape the molecular world. 
So sit back and relax as I reveal the rest of them to you. So how does structure actually impact function? Allow me to demonstrate using chymotrypsin and its cousins and the HIV proteases. If you feed these strings of amino acids to these proteases, what you'll find is that they are very picky about where they cut. Chymotrypsin only cuts next to big amino acids, trypsin only cuts positively charged amino acids, and elastase only cuts small amino acids. The catch is that they all use the same robot arms. The reaction they use is exactly the same for all three. So what's the difference? Imagine trying to use a drill on the wrong type of bolt. Even if it's the same drill, the bolt won't ever turn, right? We'll have to look elsewhere. We'll have to look right beside the arms themselves. There is a hole called the S1 pocket next to where the peptide binds and that hole is different for all three. In trypsin, there is a negative aspartate in the pocket, so it only targets positively charged amino acids. This is another common force, the electric charge. But in chymotrypsin, it's full of hydrophobic residues, so it avoids any amino acid that likes water and loves big hydrophobic ones. This is conveyed through the van der Waals force, which is created from temporary charge imbalance and polyrepulsion. You can learn more about these forces in my molecular dynamics video. This force is also used by elastase to block the hole, so only small amino acids are allowed. In fact, this whole idea of forces selecting for specific things the protein can interact with can be taken to the nth degree, to the point where proteins can recognize and read specific DNA sequences. Simply put, the shape and the forces the protein exerts work together in conjunction to give rise to its function. But this principle can also be used on the flip side too. We can use our knowledge of how the enzyme's target recognition works to design drugs that work against them. This is one clue towards how we can take down the HIV protease. But we're missing one key thing. We don't know how these little robot arms of the proteases cut proteins just yet. How does it speed the reaction up by a billion times? This is where the fourth interaction comes in, covalent bonds. And it is the reaction that constitutes what we typically think of a chemical bond. Making and breaking these bonds is what enzymes help us do better. We might be trying to engineer drugs to help protect ourselves from the invisible threat of viral proteins, but what about protecting ourselves from the invisible threat hidden on the internet? That is where Surfshark VPN, the sponsor of this video, comes in. Browsing the internet on public Wi-Fi may seem safe, but you're completely left open to phishing attacks and identity theft, putting your identity at risk. Surfshark can protect you against that. With their 3,000 servers in 100 countries, they can protect you from DDoS attacks and protect an unlimited number of your desktop and mobile devices. Surfshark cares more about your privacy beyond that. They also block ads, cookie pop-ups, and make sure your online activity is invisible, making sure that no one can know any of your private information. But even if you aren't so concerned about your privacy, Surfshark is more than just a VPN. Prices can be set at a higher rate if you're in a specific country where you rent cars, book flights, or hotels. Surfshark is able to nullify that by switching countries, allowing you to get the price that's worth your money. It's an all-in-one package that I personally use as well. Get Go to surfshark.com slash nanorooms for four extra months of Surfshark. Link in the description or on the screen right here right now. So, enzymes are like little pocket dimensions that guarantees the molecules surely hit one another, making the chemical reactions play by its rules using the very clever structure and chemistry. It's just like a domain expansion. To you right now, the enzyme may even seem to be an unnecessary and complex component that adds complicated steps for what amounts to just snipping strings in two. But if you look at how long the reaction takes without or with the enzyme, you can see why it's needed in both HIV and in humans. So what roles do these parts play in making the reaction faster? One of the biggest reasons this reaction is slow is that as a part of the reaction, the water has to donate its electrons to the protein string. Water is not great at that, coupled with a strong bond due to resonance, and we have a recipe for disaster. 
In labs, we usually supercharge this water by adding a strong base, turning water into OH-, which will gladly give away its electrons. But you can't just dump bases in your body, you dissolve and die. But, well, you only need just one OH, right? To successfully do the reaction. So why don't we try to emulate that in an area secluded from everything else? Like, for example, you know, the active site of an enzyme. The three amino acids inside of chymotrypsin are what we call the catalytic triad, and it emulates the OH- pretty well. The serine, the OH as you can see here, acts like water, it's the attacker, but it's good for nothing without histidine, which can act like a sink for the H+. So the histidine actually buffs the serine's capacity for attack, mimicking the OH-. Isn't that clever? To prove my point, deleting the serine or histidine essentially drags down the reaction speed by the same amount. These two need each other. The reaction then proceeds mostly the same as the base catalyzed mechanism, but the only problem now is that part of the chain is stuck to the chymotrypsin. So water can come in, get supercharged by the histidine again, and releases the chain, while also returning the enzyme back to its original form. The enzyme can now be recycled for the next reaction. The last of the trio, aspartate, is positioned such that it's hydrogen bonding with the histidine, so it can line up with serine. If it isn't there, the histidine would flop about and drop the speed by 100,000 times. One other cool thing of note is that the enzyme without the catalytic triad is still a thousand times faster than if it wasn't there at all. This is because the structure of the enzyme also ensures that the target chemicals are positioned properly, allowing the reaction to happen, not just proper recognition. All of this is another demonstration of why structure is the bedrock of function. This is why alpha fold was such a big deal. So, enzymes are like little pocket dimensions that guarantees the molecules surely hit one another, making the chemical reactions play by its rules by using very clever structure and chemistry. It's kind of like a domain expansion from Jujutsu Kaisen. Now, we'll use all that we've learned earlier to uncover the design choices behind a drug that can inhibit an HIV protein cutter. So up until now, the protein cutters we've looked at are known as serine proteases because they use serine as their stinger. But HIV proteases are aspartyl proteases, which works in a similar way but uses aspartate instead. They also have recognition pockets similar to the S1. The drug, indinavir, exploits a living heck out of this. If you recall, there's a step where the carbon is attached to four different things. This alcohol in the middle mimics that structure, and everything else is built around this. You're essentially fooling the enzyme into believing that you're an active target. The attachments aren't for show either, they specifically target the four recognition pockets. In addition, two carbonyl groups hydrogen bond to water, which hydrogen bonds to an NH in each of the flaps. This interaction is not possible in human proteases like renin, so this is one big possible reason why the drug only affects HIV and not us. All of this is to say that one of the best ways to guarantee an outcome is to understand the rule of how something works and play it to your favor. You should strive to create a situation in which you're able to apply your strengths freely. That is, in fact, the thematic meaning behind domain expansions in Jujutsu Kaisen. Okay, I'll stop, I'll stop, just kidding. This is the thematic meaning behind this video if you haven't noticed already. But I wonder, why are there many types of proteases? Why was the same design used everywhere in many enzymes? But the biggest question is, how were these enzymes designed? What made them the way that they are? If this video gets enough traction, I'll be making a video on this very topic. It's one of the burning questions my lab is focusing on right now. And not only that, I might just be starting a whole new series on various other enzymes. This video is only but a soft introduction into why these blobs make life possible. Thank you immensely for watching.